C. H. Spurgeon's Autobiography, Chapter 31, Divine and Human Ordination. There is good reason for asking concerning many practices. Are they scriptural, or are they only traditions of the fathers? A little ritualism in one generation may develop into downright popery in a few years. Therefore, it is well to take these things as they arise and crush them in the butt. I do not believe that, among our nonconformist ch churches, there is more than a fly or two of the priestly system in the pot of ointment. But even those flies should be purged out. Great evils have small beginnings. The little foxes are to be dreaded among the vines. Where so much is admirable, it is a pity that the specks and spots should be suffered to remain. We have a stern fight before us against ritualistic popery, and it is well to clear our decks of all lumber and go into the controversy with clean hands. It is a far more popular thing to find fault with other denominations than to point out follies and failings among ourselves. But this consideration should never occur in the right-minded except to be repulsed with a Get thee behind me, Satan. Confining myself to one branch of the subject, I ask, Whence comes the whole paraphernalia of ordination as observed among some dissenters? Since there is no special gift to bestow, why in any case the laying on of empty hands? Since we cannot pretend to that mystic succession so much vaunted by ritualism, why are men styled regularly ordained ministers? A man who has preached for years is Mr. Brown, but after his ordination or recognition, he develops into Reverend Mr. Brown. What important change has he undergone? This matter comes before me in the form of addresses upon letters, Reverend Titus Smith, Mr. Spurgeon's College, or sometimes Reverend Timothy Jones, Spurgeon's Tabernacle. Rather on this, here are reverend students of an unreverend preacher, the title being given to one out of courtesy and withheld from the other for the same reason. The reverend Titus has met with the church who will insist upon an ordination, and he is ordained. But the president of his college, having never undergone such a process, nor even that imitation of it called a recognition, remains an unordained, unrecognized person to this day and has not yet discovered the peculiar laws which he has sustained thereby. I do not object to a recognition of the choice of the church by its neighbors and their ministers. On the contrary, I believe it to be a fraternal act sanctioned by the very spirit of Christianity. But where is it supposed to be essential is regarded as a ceremony and is thought to be the crowning feature of the settlement I demure. The Reverend uh, Robinson offered up the ordination prayer has a Babylonian sound in my ears and it is not much improved when it takes the form of the recognition prayer. Is there then a ritual? Are we as much bound by an unwritten extemporary literature by, as others by the book of the common prayer? Must there always be in, must there always be usual questions, and why usual? Is there some legendary rule for the address to the church and the address of pastors? I do not object to any one of these things, but I do question the propriety of stereotyping them and speaking of the whole affair as if it were a matter to be gone about according to a certain pattern seen in the Holy Mount or an order given forth to tr in trust to the saints. I see germs of evil in the usual parlays, and therefore meet it with a quarto warnito, warnito. Has not the divine call the real ordination to preach, and the call of the church the only ordination to the pastorate? The church is competent under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to do her own work, and if she calls in her sister churches, let her tell them what she has done in such terms that they will never infer that they are called upon to complete the work. The ordination prayer should be prayed in the church meeting, and there and then the work should be done for other churches to recognize the act is well and fitting, but not if it be done for other churches to recognize the viewed as needful to the completion of the act itself. I have noticed many signs 
of an error in this direction. The following letter shows how Mr. Spurgeon regarded the question of an ordination or recognition service at the beginning of his London pastorate. 75 Dover Road, Borough, May 2, 1854. To James Lowe, Esquire, my dear sir, I sit down to communicate to you my thoughts and feelings with regard to a public recognition. I am sure I need not request your notice of my sentiment, for your usual good judgment is to me a rock of reliancy. I can trust any matter with you, knowing that your kindness and wisdom will decide rightly. I have a decided objection to any public ordination or recognition. I have scores of times most warmly expressed from the pulpit my adherency of such things, and have been not a little notorious as the opponent of the custom, which has become a kind of iron law in the country. I am willing to retrace my steps if in error, but if I have been right, it will be no very honorable thing to belie my former loud outcries by submitting to it myself. I object to ordinations and recognitions as such. Number one, because I am a minister and will never receive authority and commission from man. Nor do I like that which has the shadow of such a thing about it. I detest the dogma of apostolic succession and dislike the revival of the doctrine by delegating power from minister to minister. Number two, I believe in the glorious principle of independency. Every church has a right to choose its own minister. And if so, certainly it needs no assistance from others in appointing him to the office. You yourselves have chosen me. And what matters it if the whole world dislikes the choice? They cannot invalidate it, nor can they give it more force. It seems to me that other ministers have no more to do with me as your minister than the crown of France has with the crown of Britain. We are allies, but we are not no authority in each other's territories. They are my superiors in piety and other personal matters. But, ex to officio, no man is my superior. We have no apostles to send Titus to ordain. Prelate power is gone. All we are brethren. Number three, if there be no authority inferred, what is the meaning of the ceremony? It is customary. Granted, but we are not all ecclesiastic conservatives, and moreover, I know several instances where there have been none. Reverend W. Robinson of Cambridge agrees with me, I believe, and has not endured it himself. Reverend J. Smith had nothing of it, nor had Reverend Burton of Cambridge, nor Reverend Wooster of Sandbridge, Beach, etc., etc. Furthermore, I have seldom heard of an ordination service in which there was not something objectable. There are dinners and toasts and things in the line. There is foolishness and needless advice, or, if wise advice, unfit for public mention. I am ready to be advised by anyone on any subject in private, but I do not know how I can set in public to be told, as Mr. C. was told by Mr. S., that I must not spend more than my income, and, if married, that I must be a good husband, and not let the wife say that being a minister had lessened my affections, with all the absurd remarks of family and household matters. I do not know what sort of absurd um, homely I should get, but if I am to have it, let it be in my study, or if it be not a very good one, I cannot promise to set and hear it. I trust, my dear sir, that you will not imagine that I write warmly, for I am willing to submit, but it will be submission. I shall endure it as a self-mortification in order that you may all be pleased. I would rather please you than myself, but still I would have it understood by all the church that I endure it as a penitence for their sake. I find that friends do not care much about it, and others have, like myself, a decided aversion. I am your servant, and whatever is for the good of the church, let it be done. My knowledge is little. I simply express my feelings and leave it entirely with you. A tea meeting of members with handbills and notices on paper will be a real recognition, and if my God will make me useful, I am afraid of being recognized by all good men. I write now to you as a kind and wise friend. You can use my communication 
as think best and believe me to be. Yours with the profoundest respect, C. A. Spurgeon. Shortly after writing the above letter, Mr. Spurgeon preached the following sermon at New Park Street Chapel. The minister's true ordination. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. Ezekiel 3.17 The office of a good minister, in some respects, resembles that of the ancient prophets. Though we cannot, like Elisha, raise the dead, nor like Isaiah, pour forth eloquent predictions, nor as Ezekiel foretell certain coming and immediate judgments, yet, like them, we are commanded to teach, to warn, and to exhort. So much are we like Ezekiel, that in his commission will suit any good minister even of our day. Let us consider, number one, the minister's commission. Here is a scrap of ancient writing worthy of a place in the museum. It ought to be in every minister's study. It is the ultimate of the King of Heaven to us in our doubts as our, to our calling. It is our Emperor's protocol to all his legions. It is the minister's true ordination, a real installation worth more than a thousand papal bulls from Roman Rome bearing the mark of fisherman ring, yea, worth more than all the characters of universities or the appointments of archbishops. Notice, number one, the wording of this ancient commission. It is worded in the court language of heaven, and every letter is divine. Son of man. Here is the title by which Ezekiel is addressed. Not right reverend, nor the very venerable, but he has given to him a gracious, humbling title. Ezekiel is called Son of Man no less than ninety times. This is the name Jesus often took to himself when he was on earth, and therefore it is a truly glorious one. The gracious and all-wise Father saw that too lofty an eminence might tempt Ezekiel to pride. He therefore styles him Son of Man as much as to say, your visions, ranks, talents, and office must not exalt you, for you are, after all, only man. You must not lean on self, but you are utter weakness, being only the son of man. You must sympathize with each of your fellow creatures and deal with him, not as if you were a prince or a master, but as being like him a son of man. I have made thee a watchman. Here we read on this ancient manuscript, a true account of the making of a minister. God alone can do it. Two things are, absurd, are absolutely requisite to make a man a preacher. These, number one, special, special gifts, such as perception of truth, simplicity, aptness to impart instruction, some degree of eloquence, and intense earnestness. Number two, special call. Every man who is rightly in the ministry must have been moved there too of the Holy Ghost. He must feel an irresistible desire to spend his whole life in his master's cause. No college, no bishop, no human ordination can make a man a minister. But he, he who can feel, as did Bunyan, Whitfield, Burridge, or Roland Hill, the struggling of an impassionate longing to win the souls of men, may hear in the air the voice of God, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman. Unto the house of Israel, Ezekiel's, was a limited commission, but ours is not. It is as wide as the earth and as long as time. The world is our parish. We are not ordered to cast the net alone in the pools of Heshbon, or in the streams of Jordan, or in the lake of Gesederet. But we may cover all seas and rivers with the gospel fishing boats, the navy of Jesus. Yet still it is for the sake of the true Israel that we go. Therefore hear the word at my mouth. The ancient seers spoke not at random, but they declared what they had been taught of God. Sometimes in dreams they heard heaven's messages, sometimes by a voice from on high. But most commonly by vision did the word of the Lord come unto them. The soul inspired by God seems at times to leave the body in that narrow tube of vision which we call eyesight, and with its own eagle eye to perceive the thick cloud and to mount it into that remote region which the ordinary eye cannot see. The prophets heard the spoken word, but we have the written word, and this we must devotedly read. 
it becomes the minister diligently to study the scriptures with all the assistance he can gain from holy men who have gone before, but chiefly from the most excellent of all instructors, instructors the true interpreter, the Holy Ghost, and give them warning from me. There are other duties, but as this is the most arduous, it is especially mentioned. We are to warn the Christian if he is found backsliding or sinning, and to warn the sinner of the consequences of his sin found backsliding or sinning, and to warn the sinner the consequences of his sin of the strict justice of God and of the fearful hell in which the ungodly shall suffer. Number two, the high office conferred by this commission. It is that of watchmen. Every soldier of the cross is bound to watch, but the minister is in a double sense of a watchman. He is so called because, number one, the ministry requires great vigilance. We must not sleep. We must watch against false doctrine and false brethren. We must be ready to help united travelers and to give alarm to any who may be in danger. The true minister is to sit like the shepherd in the wilderness by night or like the whisper, whisper hearing sentinel. Number two, the ministry involves toil and trouble. Few think of the watchman who tramps by the door. Hark, there is a scuffle, a fight. Who is sure to be in it? The watchman. How the wind blows. The snow must be a foot deep. Pray, but list on the doors and stir the fire. Surely no one is out of the doors tonight except the watchman. His bare face is cut by the driving sleet. His fingers are numbed with the cold. His eyelids are almost frozen. Well, well, someone says. Never mind about the watchman and his trials. That's his work, and he is used to it. Some of you come here and sit and smile and enjoy the sermon. But there are some who criticize and find fault and slander and cumulate. The minister must bear it all, for he is the watchman. He had need of be a very tough veteran who has swallowed many norwest, Norwesters, and I know not what to fit him for the task he has in mind. Number three, the ministry should be arousing. If there be a fire or a thief or a door or a shutter unfastened, the watchman must not spare but cry aloud. We must cry out with all our might, not being afraid to disturb or alarm or hurt the feelings of the sleepers. We may as well be asleep as be mumblers or speak in such a way that none can really make out what we mean. We must preach the truth in plain, blunt, honest language which none can mistake. Every man who labors in word and doctrine should ponder over this commission and wear it next his heart and on his brow. It is to be feared that many who profess to preach the gospel are not alive to a sense of their position, but have in the next preparation, presentation to a living or having purchased their benefits, they rush in where angels, if like them, uncalled, would fear to venture. Number two, the minister's responsibility. The watchman holds a responsible office. If the sentiment by sleeping causes the death of a single person, he is a murderer. If the prisoner escapes from his charge, he shall be required to answer for his neglect. So, if the ungodly man is not warned, he shall suffer for his own guilt. But my unfaithfulness will lie as a crime on me. If the professing Christian falls, his fall is, uh, is his own. But if I have not warned him, I, am, I also am guilty. If I do not utter the whole truth, the threatenings, the promises, and the invitations of God, I shall be a sleeping sentinel and careless captain, a negligent railway, railway guard, and I shall be the slaughterer of my fellow creatures. Or if, to the professor, I give wine instead of medicine, a plaster instead of a lance, or a stone for bread, I should be a guilty wench, and God help me then, for no one would require, no one more requires help than an unfaithful minister. Number three, the minister's comfort. Number one, the Lord's call to the office. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman. Number two, the promises particular to that call. For every call from God hath the strength to perform it 
enclosed within itself. Number three, the blessed brow hardening spirit who makes us despise alike the frown or the smile of man and thus keep us from unfaithfulness. Number four, the fact that success is not required in us but faithfulness. O oh, my Father, keep me clear from the blood of all men. Amen.